Thank you very much for that very kind invitation, uh, it, 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 introduction, and for the invitation uh, to share with you uh, with your important centenary. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, quality of education. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about the system level uh, it, it, of education in Brazil. We've heard about the particular um, aspects of them, uh, of their uh, attitude to science and so on. Um, but I want to dig down now as if sort of you're just spreading out and going right into the classroom and saying, what is it that we can do at that level that might actually help some of the problems that we've been talking about? I don't think there's any promise over that, but the, the reason why I'm talking about inquiry-based uh, science education is because in many countries, um, certainly every region of the world, um, inquiry-based science education is being embraced uh, because it has the potential for uh, giving value at the individual level, the individual student who will learn and ha have some ideas about how to understand what's happening in the world around, uh, how to make decisions about their health, their use of drugs, their, um, their uh, contribution to uh, environmental problems and so on. And of course, if you have um, uh, uh, citizens uh, who have that kind of understanding, then society is also going to be the, um, the, the, the winner of this. Um, and because of these, um, I was going to say promises, um, there is actually a growing body of research about the uh, values of um, inquiry-based science education and, and, the, and its effects. Um, but I, I would have to say straight away, this is not a matter that you can compel people to do. You have to persuade them. You have to give good arguments. And that's why I'm going to try to do that. But first of all, um, to, uh, just to mention this worldwide movement is being supported by the um, in, um, IAP, that's the inter Academies Partnership, um, uh, ha, uh, education program. Um, this was a program started in uh, 2003, that, that's the uh, education program, uh, science education, um, at the initiative of, of uh, Jorge Helende, and we had m a mention of that earlier today. Um, uh, there's been various coordinators. It passed uh, after uh, Jorge had been f uh, w uh, working on it for some time. Um, he passed it on to uh, Pierre Lena in France, and the current uh, coordinator is uh, Li Yi Chung from um, the Malaysian Academy. And in all these cases, the academies have been at the back uh, and, and the supporting um, uh, body for these uh, for, for, for the work of this project um, and it exists the whole focus of the program is to promote inquiry based science education and it does this through biennial international conferences <laughs> through regional programs of which you will hear more later this afternoon in, in a particular regional um, uh, uh, it, uh, 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 America's region, um, and um, it supports programs for creating classroom activities that are inquiry-based, and most particularly, teacher professional development, which is clearly both a very important thing. Um, it produces reports on various uh, issues arising from the conferences. There were some uh, reports on how to move from primary to secondary education, for example. Um, there was another one on uh, assessment that um, uh, I can just wave here. Uh, and all these are on the IAP website for free download. Uh, and um, 
on the uh, uh, on my slides, I've given all the um, useful uh, a, 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 sorry a useful set of um, uh, a, a, a URLs, but uh, and and hopefully that uh, you, you will have access to the uh, the, the slides on the uh, on the web. So, um, sorry, I still want to just finish that last. Yes, this last point here, um, that uh, it's developing, uh, the IAP at the moment is working hard to develop relationships with UNESCO um, because uh, it's very important that all the international agencies work together to a common, a common goal of improving science education um, and uh, through uh, inquiry-based, uh, which is uh, agreed as a, the way to go. Um, so that's why on, um, in this presentation, I just want to explain why uh, inquiry-based uh, science education is so important, what it means in theory and practice very briefly, and what are the implications of, uh, of um, embracing this approach uh, for curriculum content and for student assessment. So let me start on the first of these. Um, what uh, uh, is um, why why is is it, is, is inquiry based so important? Well, it's in, uh, if we think of the overall aims of science education, these are to enable students to develop uh, understanding of fundamental ideas, ideas about the nature of science, understanding what science is. I mean, some of those answers that uh, Nelio must got from uh, the survey seem to me to be based on some kind of myth of what science is that uh, uh, students just don't know. So it's one of the aims of science education is actually to educate them in, in what sciences can do, what it can't do, uh, what its strengths and its challenges are. Um, we also want students to develop competences uh, needed to em engage in scientific activity. In other words, to be able to do a bit of science themselves, because there's nothing like doing a bit to understand what it means. Um, in fact, I don't think you can understand it without doing it. Uh, and then finally, there are scientific attitudes and informed attitudes um, uh, about science. Uh, and overall, what we want is for students to be, uh, to be able to make decisions as responsible citizens about problems, as I mentioned before, uh, affecting their, their health, their, their participation in, in, in society, and so on. Um, now, understanding featured in that uh, to considerable extent. And I think understanding is one of those words which is used without... <coughs> without a great deal of understanding. Um, so uh, what do we mean by understanding? Why, does it, why is it so important? Why is it different from other things? It seems to me that understanding is something that is created by the learner by, or any person uh, by themselves through their own mental activity, unless you've actually worked it out for yourself. You don't really understand something. So it's got to link to what you start with. Um, what I think this is, you know, I, I think what's going on in, in here uh, is like this, but I have now got to find out if it actually is, and it may change my ideas about uh, what's going on. So we want them to gradually uh, start from the uh, existing ideas that all children, we all know, bring to the classroom. They have these ideas about science. They have the ideas about scientific concepts. Um, uh, and we, it, uh, in uh, talking about these, in working, in finding evidence to support them or, or otherwise, um, they begin to reconstruct those ideas uh, so that they're actually uh, more useful and we um, which are what I'm calling bigger um, uh, because small ideas here 
uh, are ones that refer to just a few isolated phenomena, whereas big ideas will um, refer to a, a, a range of related uh, phenomena. Um, understanding involves c collecting and using evidence to test predictions and um, finally, um, it, it isn't acquiring knowledge. Understanding is generating knowledge. Uh, and there's a very big difference uh, uh, there. So how does this actually take place? Um, I just want quickly to, re to refresh um, some ideas about theories of learning. There are lots of theories of how people actually learn. And of course, we're learning all the time about this. Um, and particularly, we may know more soon if we can use neuroscience to help us. But for the moment, let me just look at the, the, the three main groups of uh, theories of, of learning. There's first of all, there's behaviorism, um, uh, which has been around a long time. Uh, behaviorism is, uh, uh, is uh, summed up by saying, learning is being taught. If you're being taught something, then you've learned it. Um, and, and that's uh, the way it is. Now, you might say, well, that's a bit shocking. It shouldn't be like that. But my goodness, go into any classrooms and you'll see that's what it is. Um, you know, if teacher teaches something, their assumption is that it's been learned. But we know that that is not the way to understanding. Rather, we've learned uh, quite a lot uh, from research and the work of people like Piaget that this, um, uh, what's important um, is making individual sense starting from the ideas that you already have. Um, and that's um, cognitive constructivism because it's constructing the knowledge. Uh, but uh, we've gone a bit further than that now. We've gone to social, recognizing the importance of social uh, constructivism. Um, in other words, the difference here is that instead of making sense of the world individually just by your own activity and your own thought, which would be um, cognitive constructivism, a kind of individual learning. We now recognize, and, and it doesn't take much uh, further thought to, to realize that that's not the way we learn. We learn actually in um, collaboration with others. We have, um, uh, we, we like to hear, why are we here to, to um, today in the last last few days, uh, because we want to share, we want to uh, ideas w with people and everybody. And if it's a good group that you have, um, the group will uh, pr each member of the group will provide some further ideas. You take that as an individual in the group. You take that on into your own thinking. It, it just changes things a little bit because I hear what you say and I hear what you say. And then I say something which indicates there's a slight change in my view and that changes everyone else's view and so on. And it's this toing and froing from group to individual that leads to understanding and it's a kind of um, shared understanding. Um, it goes on all the time. Language plays an important part in this, obviously, but also, particularly in science education, so do things, things to talk about, um, things to manipulate, things to use to find things out, whether it's the, you know, the very small calorimeter in the secondary science uh, classroom or whether it's the enormous uh, calorimeter that you use if you're wanting to um, find the mass of a neutrino, as we heard the other day. Uh, so uh, this, this is an important way of learning or recognizing way of learning. And it doesn't have to be necessarily face-to-face. -face. When you read something, when you, if you read uh, your journal article, you read it so that you want to pick something out, but it changes your ideas. Next time you write an article, you may well actually reflect on that as well. 
so there, there's a, a lot of, of, of reason that this is important. Uh, now, just think about it. If w when, when somebody is learning like that, what are they actually doing? Um, the implications of this, uh, of this view of learning, uh, the students will be working in groups, they'll be exploring, and manipulating physical materials, they'll be building on their previous experience, they'll be raising questions, communicating, listening to others, reasoning, arguing, etc., etc. Now, those of you who are familiar with inquiry-based science education will see that this is a description of science, of inquiry-based science education. And I like this idea. If you start from a good uh, way, theory of learning, you end up with inquiry-based science education. It, it, it is a, a, an essential rationale uh, for it. Uh, and that, uh, that, that leads to various kinds of definitions, uh, but this, um, uh, this one here is one I, I particularly like, perhaps because I had some, uh, I was certainly there when it was being developed, um, so that, to put it into uh, words, um, inquiry-based science education is students progressively developing ideas through learning how to investigate and build their knowledge and understanding of the world around. Sorry, that should be world around. Um, they use skills employed by scientists, such as raising questions, collecting evidence, reasoning, reviewing evidence in the light of what's already known, drawing conclusions, and discussing results. That also comes from an IAP uh, report, uh, and that's the URL for, for, for that one. So um, we've, we've, we've got one rationale uh, for... Uh, 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 for, for inquiry-based science education. Uh, another one um, is that, uh, let me just, sorry, uh, I, I, uh, let me just tell you about the, the other one because the second question that people would ask, well, okay, it's all very fine, it sounds good, does it work? Um, and um, it's actually quite, a uh, difficult uh, question to answer uh, by research, but there is uh, now good evidence um, that has been produced from a, uh, a, a longitudinal study um, funded by the US Department uh, uh, of Education um, of a, one of the better, um, or one of the really good, um, uh, IBSE uh, inquiry-based uh, 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 programs that are developed in the United States uh, by the Smithsonian uh, Foundation. And this was a, a, a really uh, careful, it's not so easy to, to do good educational research, uh, particularly as it's very difficult to get um, uh, a uh, comparison group, which they did manage uh, in, this, in this project. And they followed groups of students over three years, so it's a solid base. And they come out with this conclusion. Um, the, the findings unequivocally uh, demonstrate that inquiry-based science education improves student achievement, not only in science education, but also in reading and maths, and LASER, that's the name of the program, plays a critical role in uh, bolstering student learning, especially among the underserved populations, uh, including children who are economically disadvantaged, um, require special education, or are English language units. Again, uh, you can get the whole report uh, downloadable free uh, from here. It's a long report. But if you simply look at the uh, executive summary, uh, it, it gives you a very good feeling uh, uh, for, for, for what is in, in the report. So it works. Uh, <clears throat> now I want to go on to 
uh, implications. Because it's all right saying it works, but you know what's what's holding it back? If you've got something as good as uh, you know, mother love and apple pie, um, why isn't it actually being um, implemented? Well, one of the reasons is this uh, this uh, interaction that we have between pedagogy, and we're talking about pedagogy in terms of uh, inquiry-based teaching and learning, uh, content, curriculum content, and the uh, student assessment. These three are so much interconnected that you can't change one without changing the other. And they've got to be changed all the time. I mean, just take, for example, uh, if you try to uh, change the content towards something that is going to be uh, less fragmented uh, than most curricula are, uh, something that's going to help students develop big ideas uh, that I'll come to in a moment. You can't do that if the assessment is going to deal with the, um, it, the, the kind of knowledge that can be memorized or with that uh, piecemeal um, uh, and individual items. And you can't do it if you're constantly assessing uh, students in that kind of way, with that kind of thing. And so you're not, you're not going to be able to implement this kind of pedagogy if, if the assessment is one that they can get away with by just memorizing, or rather have to uh, memorize. So if you're wanting understanding, we've got to change somehow the assessment. Uh, and I'll come to that in a moment, but let me start by t saying what are the implications for the, um, uh, for the content? Uh, so the, the curriculum content. Um, one of the things that uh, will have struck, uh, struck you probably um, in thinking about uh, inquiry-based science education is that it, if you're going to do it uh, thoroughly, if you're going to have the student working groups raising questions, uh, pr solving their own problems, communicating, ten and having time to reflect on what this means for their learning and applying it to their lives, that's time consuming, very time consuming. Um, so there is going to be a need then to focus on what's most important. You can't just teach everything that you think um, uh, is, is possible or has been taught, which is usually the thing. Historically, it's what uh, happens. Uh, what we've often faced with in many countries, I'm sure it uh, must be in Brazil, but I, haven't, I have to agree that I haven't seen uh, your, uh, your curriculum. But this is in all countries, whether they're developed countries or not, that the, the curriculum is overcrowded, overspecified, and uh, appears to lack uh, uh, continuity. You do a bit here, you do a bit there, none of n these things never tie up with each other, uh, and th they end up feeling um, uh, that there's certainly so much to cover in terms of these little itsy bits uh, that um, it, the only way we can deal with it is by memorization, and so memorization will uh, replace understanding. And then the student's perspective, I don't know whether this was covered in, in the Rose um, uh, report, I can't, I can't remember, uh, but certainly um, what students think about science, not science as a whole, but uh, about particular things, they see it as uh, fragmented, no coherent picture, and what they say is this constant um, uh, phrase they use, it's not relevant. Why am I learning this? It's not relevant uh, to me. Um, so we've got to do something about that. Uh, and we've got to make sure that they do see that their classroom activities are helping them to explain things that they find uh, important. 
so uh, those are some implications for the curriculum. What are we going to do about it? Well, uh, here's part of the solution, by no means a magic bullet. Um, but one way is to conceive of the goals of science education, not in terms of a collection of facts and theories, but rather uh, as a progression towards key ideas. Uh, and this means ideas that are relevant or seen as relevant by the students to their lives, um, that help them to progress from the small ideas that they'll deal with as young children, um, that, deal, that deal with the particulars of their environment and the life they live, but these have to be gradually made bigger so that they can generalize uh, to other experiences. Um, and uh, ideas that provide a map for curriculum developers so that we can have um, classroom materials that are related to these. So um, I'm getting round to the idea of um, uh, identifying a few big ideas that we want to work towards in uh, the science uh, uh, in the science uh, um, activities right across the whole of their schooling uh, from the age of five to the age of 18. Um, now, um, so how do we identify these ideas? Um, well, for a start, there's no single right answer. People sometimes ask me, how did you get those ideas? Uh, you know, where, where were they? Why didn't we know them before? Well, I said, well, th th you know, they... they uh, are ones which are a matter of value and judgment of people. Uh, and that's, uh, so the most important thing is to get the right people together. And then to use the experience of uh, experts in science, science educators, educa uh, engineers, and so on, uh, to establish a set of criteria that you would use to select the ideas, um, make judgments about, for example, how many you want to use. I mean, you could have a, a hundred big ideas, you could have half a dozen. Um, so it, those sort of decisions have to be made. Um, and then uh, having got something uh, available, you validate it against the, the scientific community. Well, that's what we did. And these were the people we got together. Um, I won't dwell on it, but the only reason why I wanted to uh, put this here, because just to show the international, um, this is uh, 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 Guillermo uh, from uh, Mexico. Uh, this is uh, from, ch uh, from China, uh, from Canada, from the United States, France, um, Chile, uh, Scotland, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so we got together and we made sure we didn't move for two and a half days until we thought about our big ideas. So what, what are these? What actually came out? Well, first of all, the criteria we used. Um, wide explanatory power. They have to be ones that are useful in explaining a range of, of related phenomena. Uh, they have to relate to understanding issues about everyday life. That's the relevance part. They have to provide enjoyment and satisfaction. Things that are going to make the students say, yes, I want to be a scientist. That isn't the idea of this, incidentally. The idea is this is for all students. It's not for those, you know, who are going to be scientists. We want everyone to have these, uh, th this understanding. Um, uh, it's got to ha they've got to have cultural significance, um, reflecting science as human endeavour, knowing, you know, something of the history of science and how, I mean, that's such an exciting uh, subject. Um, so this, these were um, the ideas that we came up with. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go through them because if you... Um, Um, again, it's uh, on the web uh, and freely available. But I just want to show you that, first of all, there were 10 uh, ideas of science. 
Uh, and, um, no, you know, no more, no less. We felt that was actually about the right number. It's about the right level um, so that there, they can be realistic goals um, if you have them too, uh, too many of them. I know that there's a list, of course, we looked at a whole lot of lists of, that people have produced, and there's one, you know, uh, 50 ideas that you should know about science. Well, okay, 50 is rather a large number. It's not going to help. Um, but as well as those 10 ideas of science, we had four ideas about science. Uh, in other words, the nature of science. Science is about finding the cause or causes of phenomena of the natural. So they find out, begin um, to, to learn um, how, what, what science is about. Uh, so that, those were the, if you like, the labels, the headings there. Um, but the idea of having these is the progression towards them, that you develop a big idea right from the start, but it's a little idea, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger, and so on. So very difficult to think about a way of describing this. And we uh, decided that, that we should use this. Um, and, and again, obviously, you're not going to be able to read this, but it's just the structure that I want to point out. Sorry. I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, there we are, right. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, the overall big idea in this case is that organisms are organized on a cellular basis uh, and have a, a finite lifespan. Um, this is uh, then expanded into a, a sort of a, a, a slightly longer uh, a, a description. Um, but the this description of the development of this idea is in this, this section here, which is what we call a narrative. It's a story. Uh, it's a story of um, how things uh, develop. Uh, and uh, we put the side here a little strip with these numbers are vague ages of children. We didn't want to indicate that this is what you do at this level, this is what you do at this level, because that's not how things learn, how children learn. Um, uh, but uh, rather, just to give uh, the general um, impression that there were uh, developments, there's a development, uh, and what, ha what goes on down here is, is different, very different from what is learned up here. Without that, without starting there, you're not going to reach there. Uh, so that was, um, for each of these big ideas, the, the 14 uh, in total, we developed those kind of na narrative, the discussion, um, with some guidance as to what was appropriate at what level. And um, the, uh, we, we actually produced the first version of this in um, 2010. Uh, it was taken up and circulated quite widely and translated. Uh, we met again five years later, and this is when this was produced. Uh, and in the meantime, we had that, that um, validation, if you like, from the scientific community. And this... Uh, uh, one that I've, I've, I've now got here um, has been uh, translated into um, seven or eight languages already, and certainly the, um, uh, the, the uh, they're again all on the website. Here's some of the uh, URLs for that. Now, I was going to go on to talk about the implication of assessment, which I think is very important, but we've run out of time. And so I'm not going to try your patience with that to do it quickly um, another time. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Nelly. So, you know, we, we have this time limitation because there was this uh, time, you know, we have a one hour uh, delay from, from the morning and also something in the, in the afternoon. And there is a, there is a, 
there is a problem here with the museum because uh, they have to close at 8 p.m. So, uh, so we have to end. Of course, uh, yesterday already they, they stayed uh, more time and, and they didn't like it at all uh, because the, the people who work here have to work uh, more time and so it's, it's not really uh, enjoyable for them. So uh, thank you very much. We have time now for two questions, two, just two. Hi, hello. You have the two already. Huh? Uh, my question is for the panel in general, and actually also Luis. Um, so in the, we've seen the research, in the Rose research, that we have um, many people disagreeing with being scientists. But maybe these, uh, this disagreement is related to they don't actually know what being a scientist is like. So we go in uh, the subject of teaching them science in different ways. But my question is related that now that a new director in the Brazilian Academy of Sciences has just been elected, what can we actually do right now, in the next years, to change the way science is being uh, taught to make people realize that what really being a scientist is like? So what can we do right now? What can the Academy do? So, you know, if we just take uh, the, the other question, uh, please, short questions. Huh? Yes. I think, uh, you know, where is the microphone? Yes, yes, oh, I uh, have it already, thank you. Uh, I would like your, your opinion on the idea uh, uh, that uh, one of the force reinforcing traditional memory-oriented education could be the confusion between evaluation, I mean, grading students as a means into evaluation as an end, that is, uh, it becomes its objective on its own. Just shortly consider the, the, the case of a teacher was dilemma. Uh, either he tries to train his students to, uh, to, work, uh, to perform well on the examination or to try to learn uh, to, to them yeah. to learn something. Yeah. And if you look at the way educational program curricula are designed, uh, it's a natural tendency and facility to design them with an easy way of grading, of yeah. evaluating, okay. actually, the, yeah. the results. And uh, as, uh, this is more challenging than uh, 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 designing uh, yeah. evaluation assessment, as you showed. Yeah. For, that was uh, not a short question. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just to, to, to look back to science, if we look at our current research system, yeah, I yeah. think there is also a main confusion between yeah. evaluation as a mean and evaluation as an end. Okay, so I'm sorry, the reply must be much shorter than the <laughs> questions, because you know, otherwise we'll be thrown out of the... Well, uh, that was such an... Oh, do, you, do you mind, Nelio? I, 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 that's such an important question about assessment, and it's a bit that I've had to leave off, unfortunately. I wanted to... I, I'm going to go, you know, a bit longer than you wanted, but... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, there are two, two main functions of, of assessment, and one is to help learning, and I think you were referring to that. Uh, and this is something that teachers do all the time it, in, in the classroom, uh, picking up information about what, uh, how the learning is going, uh, how, whether they're achieving the goals that they had for, feeding back about how they can help uh, achieve those goals a bit more and the teacher herself or himself um, making uh, uh, adjustments uh, so there's a sort of feedback into the teaching and, and into the now when it comes to summative assessment and that is it, the, the sort of when you want to put down a grade or something like that it, it, that's where the problem comes because we generally use tests which are not valid. They just are not valid. Um, uh, and so I was looking for a, a, an alternative to testing. And I think you find it if you think about what's going on in the classroom. It's with the formative assessment, the teachers are getting in, uh, uh, gathering evidence. The students are producing work. There's evidence there. You don't need to put people into a test situation to get find out what what you need to do is accumulate that, and to begin at a certain time when you need to look at you, you need to make some record and you meet, need to make some re report. Then at that time um, you can um, 
sort out what's the best evidence you've got there and then compare it with the, the goals, the achievement, or what the curriculum says uh, at that point. It means a, a lot of training for the teacher. There's no doubt about that. But it's the way to go, because if I just don't, I do, would hate to see you going down the road that so many countries have gone, um, which is to impose a lot of standardized testing, which narrows the curriculum, particularly science, uh, and it's totally uh, unproductive. I just would say that many ministers of education should be here in this room to listen to this. Thank you. Yeah.